Would you turn there with me, please? Psalm 23. Now, while you're turning there, if you uh, uh, are with us tonight and um, you've not been with us and you say, well, hey, I'm glad that we're able to do Sunday evening and I'm joining you, we, um, we had to conclude, for various reasons, we concluded our Sunday evening sermons right back at the 1st of March, uh, and then we went from that into a thing that we did uh, called Ask the Pastor, and then as we got toward Christmas, we were able to use some Sunday nights for outreach, and, uh, and also as an opportunity to see how we could reopen our Sunday evening worship uh, to spend time in God's Word and worship and praise the Lord. And so that's how we have entered back in under the oversight of our elders and trying to do so safely, as you see, but also, but, but do so uh, to assemble together to bring before the Lord the morning and evening sacrifice of praise to his name on the Lord's day. Now, uh, as, this is, um, as this is before us and the opportunity, uh, I was trying to determine when we start back, what do I do? Um, well, I, I was led to kind of get to the issues of essentials in the Christian life in light of this present distress on Sunday mornings, thus the series of 18 sermons on the essentials, um, foundations of the Christian life as distilled in the Apostles' Creed. And now to go to, um, and then to go to the, uh, uh, to what I think is the glorious exposition of the gospel of God, the book of Romans, which is where we are on Sunday morning. But what do we do when we start back on Sunday nights? Well, the Lord just led me to suggest uh, to the elders, and they approved, that we just go back to where we left off. We were in the series, If I Should Die Before I Wake. And what does the Bible say about death? Wasn't trying to be morbid, but I really feel part of Sunday nights. Sunday nights for me are wonderful for three reasons. Number one, we have the privilege as a congregation to, as it were, sandwich the Lord's Day, coming out of a week to give praise to God from whom all blessings flow, and then Sunday evening out of worship getting prepared to go into week. Having been scattered, we gather and praise God for his transcendent glory, and then in the eminence of God and the presence of God, we gather in order to scatter into a coming week as, as a servants of our Savior. So I think that Sunday nights are good and proper for worship as we focus on Lord's Day evening on the imminence of God, His presence, His comforting, encouraging uh, presence, convicting, consoling presence in our life through various passages of Scripture. It's also a wonderful way to launch into the next week, having been encouraged with one another in anticipation of a coming Lord's Day and the challenges to serve Him each and every day until that day. But a third thing that I, uh, and, and, uh, and also that we can use Sunday evening for outreach opportunities as we have all during the Advent season. But <clears throat> one of the things that I love about Sunday evening is it gives me a chance to do expositional preaching on Sunday morning, as we're doing in Romans, and then to do topical expository preaching on Sunday night. In other words, in your Christian life, I want to be part of discipling you. Now, I may not be leading a small group of discipling you, nor may I have a one-on-one -on -one with you, although I'm available for one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, in meeting with you from time to time, of course, and then, uh, and then I have a number of small groups, but that's probably not my area of focus. But I believe that the preaching of God's Word on the Lord's Day morning and the Lord's Day evening is an essential part of discipleship. And what I like to do on Sunday nights is to take not simply the themes that come up through expository preaching on Sunday morning, but to find themes that God's people are grappling with or dealing with, then go to texts of expositional explanation of those themes. So you build it into people's lives on certain issues. Well, what happens when you die is an issue, isn't it? In Charlotte, I had this wonderful couple that I had the privilege to pastor. And, um, and I remember when their 12-year-old boy um, contracted a brain tumor, and we pastored and worked with them all the way through it. And uh, the Lord called this young boy home at age 12. 
I remember being in the hospital with them. And I remember this father and mother I was hugging him and then telling him, it's okay. He was struggling so much. He said, it's okay. And then I saw Nathaniel just go right into the presence of the Lord with a pleasant, um, just a look on his face that showed the anticipation. And then I remember his mother turning to me. Pastor, where and what's happening for him right now? Please tell me. Please tell me. In this congregation, not many years ago, there's a fine young woman. I didn't get permission, so I'm not going to use her name, but she also fought uh, a battle with what was anticipated to be terminal cancer. And um, what a great warrior for Jesus. And, um, and I remember um, her family was here, her father and mother were members of the church here, and are, are members of the church, or uh, she was, and she and her husband, and her kids, and it's just a great privilege to be her pastor. And I would make visits and talk with her from time to time, and, um, and she was relatively young, and so she sent word, um, I think it's getting close, could we talk again? And I said, certainly, so I came out, and um, and as I sat down, she looked at me eye to eye, and she said, well, Pastor, time's come. Pastor, <laughs> I got some ideas, but I'm asking you now. What's going to happen after my last breath? What will happen next? Now, I know all the answers. I know the quotes, but can you just give me some insight? What's going to happen? Of course, we've got some folks in this church that uh, are meeting the Lord, and they're on their way to meet the Lord, and I go to meet them, and they say, well, pastor, let me tell you what's going to happen. So I've got that too uh, as a pastor. But that's, that's part of discipleship, is how does the grace of God give us direction? How does it undergird us? How does it lead us, as the Heidelberg Catechism says, as our only comfort in life and death. How do you do that? How do you deal with that? And What do we expect? And what should we expect? And what has God said? And what has God promised? So one of the things we did, we started this series, and I purposely took the title from a childhood prayer. Many of you had the same prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my, that's a very important, theologically accurate statement your mother taught you. I pray the Lord my soul to take. If I should die, there's our title, before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Where? What will it be like? What's going to happen? This is not the time for pastoral flights of fancy. This is not the time for platitudes. And this is not the time for sentimental efforts to comfort as well-meaning as they may be. We want to know, what does God say to us? What does God reveal to us? So we started and we went through three sermons together. Number one is for me to try to lay out for you that death is not a part of creation. You've heard my illustration. <clears throat> the man that called me and said, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm, it looks like I'm going to be dying soon, uh, but would you pray that I'll have a, a natural death? And I told him, I said, no, I'm, I won't. And he said, why not? And I said, because I can't. Because in the Christian world in life view, there's no such thing as a natural death. Death is not a part of, quote, nature, God's created act. The Bible identifies it as an intruder, an enemy that must be conquered by our Savior. It's one of the enemies that he came to defeat. And by the way, I, 
uh, let me just say to Chris and Ben, and I know that they all, and this morning I've just overwhelmed and this evening how they have very thoughtfully chosen songs to contribute to what we are studying in the Lord's Day morning and evening. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, we are able to tie worship together, whether it's a scripture reading, a confession, or what we're singing, and the... Um, with what our focus is on that Lord's Day. <clears throat> and, and what we've just sung songs of the victory of Christ over death and his triumph. And what does that mean? What are the ramifications of it? So death is an enemy, it's not natural. You don't find it in Genesis one through two, you only find it after Genesis three. You don't find it as a part of God's creation act. That's a Darwinian. Um, that's a Darwinian uh, atheistic evolutionary view. What we understand is that God created everything good and God created the heavens and the earth and death with its curse has now fallen after sin. The wages of sin is death. The second thing that I tried to teach you, uh, if you'll remember, is that death that sin brings is threefold. There are three deaths that the Bible teaches. The word death is the word thanatos. It means separation. It means a radical separation. Um, don't, uh, don't, think of, um, don't think of a perforated pamphlet tearing apart. No, it means a separation. And what, does it, what is being separated? Well, physical death is the separation of the soul from the body. And it wasn't designed to be separated. That wasn't the design. So don't think like a Greek. Don't think like Plato. Don't think like, which by the way, has undergirded almost all of our educational system. But don't think that way. A biblical worldview, a biblical cosmology does not present your body as a vehicle carrying your soul. And death is kind of opening the door to let it out. No, that's a pagan world in life view. A biblical world in life view is God made the body of Adam and then he breathed into that body a soul, a living soul, and he became a living soul. Up until then, he's a corpse. And then he breathes in that soul, spirit, heart, mind, a number of terms are used to describe that which makes us in the image of God. Our bodies come in the image of our parents. But our soul is that stamp of, of uh, imago Deo, that we are made in the image of God. And so then Adam becomes a living being. So what is physical death? It is the separation of the soul from the body. Don't think of just something tearing apart. Think of something being rendered, rended apart. Think of, um, think more of two threads woven into one cloth that are being torn apart. They weren't made to be torn apart. They were made to impact. They are interdependent upon each other, the physical and the spiritual. What you do physically affects you spiritually. What you do spiritually affects you physically. It is an interdependent relationship. Wasn't designed to be separated. So the unnatural separation of the body from the soul, James chapter two, verse 28, that the body and the soul are separated at physical death. Second death is spiritual death. And because when Adam sinned, we sinned. We sinned in Adam, and when Adam sinned, we sinned. And the curse of sin is death, separation, and that means the separation of the sinner from God himself. That we are separated from God because of our sin. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 2, when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So when in Adam, when he sinned, we sin, and therefore when Adam is separated from God, then we are all separated, and then we are born and we sin. But we don't sin 
and get a sin nature, we have a sin nature because we sinned in Adam when Adam sinned. And when he sinned, we sinned, and thus we are born sinners, which is why we sin. That's why actual sin comes from that original sin. Thus, we are separated from God. Thirdly, the third death is eternal death. Separate, depart from me into that place of hell, which is an unfathomable, unending um, a torment of the judgment of God for all eternity. Depart from me. The Bible says, at least I think, the two phrases that cause me the most concern when I read the Bible is the phrase in Romans 1 that we're about to get to in the next couple of weeks. God gave them over. As he removes his common grace as well as redeeming grace, God gave them over. And the most, and the most, so the one that is even more horrific in my ears than that is the words, depart from me. And uh, that is a phrase that is just overwhelming. The departing from the felt presence of God under the judgment of God for all eternity. <clears throat> the place is called Gehenna or the lake of fire. But in Christ, we have victory over that death. Christ has won the victory over Satan and sin and death and hell and the grave. So in Christ, even though we die, yet we live physically. And in Christ, we are born again. And you, when you were dead in your trespasses and sin, God caused us to be born again to a living hope. So you've been brought from spiritual death to spiritual life in Christ. And instead of the eternal death of hell, we receive the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ because of his victory. The other thing that we then looked at was uh, having looked at those that having looked at how death enters, how death spread to all men, as Romans 5 says, and then how, uh, and then how Jesus has won the victory over death, we now begin to take a look at, well, what happens as believers who have been rescued from spiritual death, regeneration, we've been born again, have been assured that eternal death is not ours because Christ endured it on the cross for us and satisfied the wrath of God, then what about this issue of physical death if we are, if, if Jesus has not come back yet and we die? What happens next? Now, I, I'll go ahead and tell you, this is a little bit like this morning. I've, I've prepared more than we're going to be able to do, but that's okay. I'm coming back next Sunday night and I hope you will too. But I, I, here's where I want to take us in the next couple of weeks. I want us to understand what happens next. We call it the intermediate state. The intermediate state. What happens next? Secondly, that's probably going to take us this week and next week. Then I want us to look at what about our final state? What is our final state? And then thirdly, what about unbelievers, their intermediate state and their final state, which means we need to, we're going to get to the doctrine of the new heavens and the new earth, the final state, and the doctrine of hell, Gehenna, and that is the final state for the unbelievers to try to understand what the Bible says about that. But where we are right now is when we die, we move to what our theologians have rightly called an intermediate state, meaning it's not the final state. But what is that state? Well, there's some key passages of Scripture we need to read and understand. So now we're ready to go to those passages I wanted us to get started with. Go with me to Psalm 23. 
Psalm 23, and you can start to jot some of this down as we walk our way through it. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. There's our life with Jesus, the great shepherd, because of his redeeming grace. Now watch, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Notice, unless Jesus comes back, you will go through the valley of the shadow of death. He informs you of that. Now, pastor, is that everybody? Well, almost. We've got a couple of exceptions. We've got Enoch, and we've got Elijah, and we've got um, uh, them who were taken up into the presence of the Lord. Enoch walked with the Lord and was no more. And Elijah was taken up into his presence. Well, Harry, what about those whom Jesus raised? Uh, and uh, um, they died and he got raised uh, and they were resurrected like Lazarus. Well, they had to die again. But here's the basic lesson, except for those two exceptions that are there for a very specific reason. It is this, and that's the biblical truth. It is appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment. And when you die, this Jesus who has saved you, who has led you in paths of righteousness, who in life has fed you in green pastures, this Jesus who has shepherded you into life through regeneration, through justification, through adoption, will now, will now shepherd you into glorification. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, yes, you will make that walk. As you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you do not fear any evil. And one of the ways he's trying to communicate that to you, in your last breath at death, you are encountering the shadow of death. You know, it's very interesting. Please listen now. There, it's very interesting how the Bible is trying to keep communicating to you that Christians will die unless Jesus comes back first. But when you die, your death is different because of the victory of Jesus. One of the ways that's communicated is with a euphemism for death that is used for believers. Jesus used it. I'm going to the text in just a minute. Jesus used it and when he talked about Lazarus falling asleep. And they said, well, if he's asleep, then what's the problem? He said, no, 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 he, he's dead. But what I'm telling you, this one's a believer and he calls his death sleep, not because of an exotic notion of soul sleep. What he's trying to communicate with a euphemism is that the death of a believer does not have evil attached to it because, for the vic because of the victory of Christ, the death of a believer is the transformation and translation of the believer into the presence of the Lord. Just like you come out of a tiredness into sleep and then into a new morning. That's why he uses that euphemism. Here, he's using something else. Death, he called the death of a believer, he, he calls it a valley, but he says it's a shadow. I love the way Donald Gray Barnhouse explains this. He said to his grandson one day when he was doing a funeral and his grandson asked him about this text, about what does it mean, the shadow of death? And he said, well, look, and there he was riding through the streets of Philadelphia, and this gigantic truck pulled up beside them in the noonday sun. And when the truck pulled up, the shadow of that truck just engulfed their car. And he said, son, that truck that just pulled up, it's now dark, isn't it? Why? Well, because the shadow is over us. So the shadow of that truck has hit us, and we hit that shadow, but we're okay. Now, son, if that truck hits us, we're not okay. Apart from Christ, death hits full force with all of its evil. In Christ, you go through the shadow of death. 
but he's not through. Now look at what else he says. That I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So at death, last breath, there is no evil for the believer. It is translation. And therefore, you go through the shadow of death. Then he says, you don't go through it by yourself. I'll be with you. I remember when I was down at Richard's Barbecue for a meeting on a Monday, I mean, I'm sorry, on a Wednesday morning, and, and Curtis Tanner came down to get me and tell me that my father had just died. And I remember when I went up to take care of things in my home and the service and everything, I remember one thing that struck me as I would, is, uh, you know, I, I really wished I could have been there with my dad uh, to be with him at that moment, just to be there for him and with him. But one thing I was greatly comforted with, uh, I was, uh, I couldn't be there, but the Lord was. The Lord will be with his people at that moment. You don't go through this valley alone. He is walking with you through it. His staff and his rod are comforting you. Now, when you walk through it, where are you headed? Well, here's what he says. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My, you, um, you anoint my head with oil. That's the anticipation of that baptism with the Holy Spirit every believer receives that seals us into Christ. The Spirit of God has been poured out of you. You have table fellowship with the Lord here and into eternity at that glorious marriage supper of the Lamb. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Well, what about after that? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, now we're ready for that second text. Take your Bibles and go with me to John 14. We're going to dwell in the house of the Lord, the Lord's house that's prepared for us for all eternity. Would you go with me to John 14? Now, folks, we're doing this step by step. I'm fully aware I can't get it all done tonight. This is one of those I'd give anything to be able to have a captive audience uh, for two weeks. I can't, but, um, but we'll try to uh, keep you uh, building on this as we move into next week. Here's what he says in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him. and You've seen him. Why? Because Jesus is the exact representation for you. He has manifested the glory of the Father in your presence. But now, what is he saying? I've got to go, he says, now let, I know you're fearful, I know you're troubled about all of this, but I've got to go because when I redeem you here, I've got to finish re work, the work of redemption on you. I have done the work of redemption for you. Now when I go away, I will do the work of redemption on you by the Holy Spirit to bring you to be with me. Therefore, I am preparing a place, my Father's house, I am preparing a place for you. And what makes it glorious in heaven? You'll be with me. You will be with me forever. Now, I'm going to come back for you. But if you die before, we get, before he comes back, then I'll bring you to be with me. I'll be with you through that moment, and I'll take you to be with me. 
and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what will happen. Well, if he is going to bring us to be with him, and what makes heaven heaven? Now, I know some of you are going to ask me, and I promise you I'm going to talk about it. You know, is your dog going to be there or not? I promise I'm not going to skip those questions. But what makes heaven heaven is not your dog. And with all due respect, what makes heaven heaven is not even her loved ones. You'll be with me. I'll be with you. You'll be with me. The one that came for you. I'll bring you and walk with you to be with me in the house of the Lord forever. If that's true, now we've got the next text to read. Take your Bibles and go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because of that glorious truth, now we're ready for another truth. Go with me to 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look with me in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, that's our body, we have a building from God. God is preparing a place, a building for us. This is a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan. <laughs> when you get my age, you even go a lot more groaning. So there is some groaning in this tent that we're doing. Longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. This tent is constantly enduring the physical consequences of the curse of sin. Sickness, pandemic, COVID-19, all of this is here because of the curse of sin, even death itself. And we long to be unburdened by it and to set this cursed tent aside, not to be without a tent, not to be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This mortal body will become a new tent that is a new body, and it's not mortal, destroyed. It will be transformed and translated into that which is eternal, an eternal body, and that will be swallowed up by life. And he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. How do I know that I'm going to get this new dwelling place that he is preparing for me? Because he has sent the Spirit to me. He is the down payment. He is the guarantee. And remember, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So the Spirit of God is his guarantee of the fulfillment of this body that is shaped for all eternity. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body. Why? to be at home with the Lord. I'm preparing a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. What will I want to do in my new body, in the new heavens, in the new earth? I want to please him. What do I want to do in this body until I get to there? I want to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, so 
Remember the other, it's appointed to men once to die and then the judgment. Who's going to appear at the judgment? Everybody. Now hold on. I don't have time to go there. Let me just give you one sentence. Everyone appears before the judgment seat. And if your name is in the book of life, that judgment will be for stewardship. If your name is not in the book of life, that judgment will be declaring the consequences of sin and condemnation for all eternity. For the believer who is in the book of life, they will be, that judgment is for stewardship of our life in Jesus Christ. But until we're there, where we are now is to make it our aim to please him. Now, remember one more text I want to ask you to go to for tonight, and that's Philippians chapter 1. Would you go there with me? Philippians chapter 1. Just keep going to your right. Remember the Philippians chapter 1, right after Ephesians. And you get to chapter 1. <clears throat> now you see why Paul is saying what? Remember? If I'm here, I want to please the Lord, but where I long to be is to be with him in that body he's prepared for me so that I am at home with the Lord. That's why, P, that's why Paul, writing from prison with the possibility of his death from prison, says this. He says in verse uh, 19, um, he says, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And then what does he say? as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. At all times, what I want to do is please him. For to me, to live is Christ. To die is what? Gain. To die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart. Why? I'll be with Christ. Now, Christ is with me by his spirit, but then, not by faith, but by sight, I'll be with him. For that is far better. Remember, to live it's Christ to die is what? Gain. Far better. Far. But not just better. Far better. And then what does he say? But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue to be with you all for your progress and join the faith, so that in, you, in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. In other words, what he's saying is this. Look, I, I am in prison. He could, he could send the death warrant. I could be put to death. I just want you to know that's my desire is to go and be with the Lord. But I also have a desire to minister to you. Now, you know, I think what I'm pretty convinced of, he's going to leave me here for your account. Okay, that's fine with me. I love you, but I want you to know if he doesn't, I don't lose, I win. To die is gain. So, y'all will remember I had a series of about eight years where it seemed like I was just going to put the medical community uh, into, um, you know, into uh, orbit with surgery after surgery after surgery. I said to Cindy one time, I think the Lord brought me to Briarwood, Birmingham, so UAB could operate on me for a while. And uh, so I, I remember that. And of course, a couple of them were relatively serious. And, um, and uh, you know, I was talking with Cindy about it. And, and those, my kids, we all talked about it and prayed about it. And I just explained to them, y'all need to know something. If this, the Lord calls me home, if he does, it's okay. I'll miss you, but I'll wait for you. <laughs> but I win. I don't lose. So if I go under and then go up, I'm okay. That's gain. That's far better. Far better. Now, if he leaves me, that means he's got something for me to do. And that'll be good. That won't be bad. That'll be good. 
So one of you who will remain nameless right now came up to me uh, after I left the hospital and said, well, you seem to be doing well. I said, I am. And they said, well, you, when you woke up out of anesthesia and found out you were still here, were you disappointed? Well, I appreciated the insightful question. <laughs> and certainly to a sense. But I said, no, I'm not, because God's sovereign. If I had gone, that would be better. But if I'm here, it's for a reason. Now, what I need to do is embrace that reason and that opportunity. This isn't my demotion. This is my call. I got more for you to do. You see, in the sovereign hand of God, even though we know that dying is better because we're with him, he made us to live. That's why we don't go out and grab a knife and stick it in our heart. Well, I'm just going to, it'd be better, I'll just go on to heaven. No, we were made to live. That's why even in our last breaths, we're trying to take them. God made us to live for him. If it's here, Christ. If it's there, gain. That's the way he is laying it out for you. Well, I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, to be able to walk you through the rest of this. So I'm going to give you a couple of passages of Scripture for next week, and you can't miss next week. You can't miss because this I've only got half of what I prepared for you, so you got to come back for the second half next week. And when you come back next week, I want you to be ready for Luke 16, and I want you to be ready for Hebrews 12, and I want you to be ready, Hebrews 12, and uh, uh, specifically verses 18 through 24. And I want you to be ready for Matthew chapter 22. And then I want you to be ready for Revelation 7, 9 through 17, which gives you what is happening in the intermediate state. But can I anticipate next week in my closing remarks today? from what we've done in laying all this groundwork and this foundation. The intermediate state, in your mind, you're probably thinking, particularly if you've got a loved one that has died, well, they went to the intermediate state, they're not in the final state. I mean, the, won't the final state be better? Yeah, but the, inter the intermediate state's not bad. It's gain. It's far better. It's not the ultimate better, but it's far better than here. So yes, your loved one's far better. Now listen, I hear people say this all the time. People go through difficult times and say, oh, they've now died. And you know, they were struggling so much, but praise the Lord, they're just tripping on them, running up and down with the angels on the streets of gold. No, they're not. Not yet. Their body's in the grave. Well, where are they? They're in Abraham's bosom. They're in paradise. They're in heaven. That Hades, that place of the dead, that Sheol has two dynamics, torment, intermediate judgment, called the abyss, and blessing, comfort, called Abraham's bosom, paradise, heaven. You remember the thief on the cross? I'm, I'm a little ahead. Please come back. Remember the thief on the cross? Today you'll be with me where? What does Paul say paradise is? He tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, it's heaven. I was caught up to the heavens, paradise. What is Abraham's bosom? Abraham's in heaven. The Bible tells you that in Hebrews chapter 11. It's another way to say heaven. Let me try to say it this way. When I, became, when I was growing up, I grew up in the Christian Missionary Alliance Church, and our pastor lived in a parsonage. I got saved in a Reformed Presbyterian Evangelical Synod Church. 
and the pastor's residence was called a manse. And I remember saying to Cindy, who was Southern Baptist when we got married, what is a manse? And she said, honey, I don't know. It's, but I think it's the preacher's home. I mean, the bulletin every week is, go to the manse to meet the pastor's wife. And she said, I think it's a, and I said, oh, you mean the parsonage. But I, it took me, I had to go to seminary to get this thing straight. I found out it's the same place. Preacher's house, manse, parsonage. The intermediate state, heaven, Abraham's bosom. Paradise, gain, better. What will we be doing? Will we know each other? How will we be able to live when we get to that intermediate state? Okay, pastor, I'm believing it's better. What will it be like? I'm glad you asked because that's why we're going to Revelation 7 next week. And we're going to find out seven things about this place that is far better. Then the next week, we're going to find out about the ultimate place, the new heavens and the new earth, where we get a new body for the new heavens and the new earth. But pastor, that intermediate state, is it bodiless? Yep. Your body's in the grave. It'll stay there until the resurrection. Remember that Apostles' Creed? I believe in the resurrection of the body. I do it time and time again when I do a funeral and I tell everybody there, hey, reason we're here is God's not through yet. There in the present, absent from the body, present with the Lord, but God's not through yet. He's going to raise this body for a new heavens and a new earth. But what is that joy that I have? What is that gain I have in the intermediate state? What will I be doing? Well, there are three passages of Scripture, and one of them, Revelation 7, that tell us what it is like while we are there in that intermediate state. And it's glorious. It's better than this. Yet there's more to come. So that's where we will be next week. But here's my question. <laughs> my question is not, are you going to die? Uh, my question is, when you, I hear this, I, I remember talking with a guy the other day, I was sitting down with him, he said, well, you know, preacher, if I die, I said, whoa, 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 wait, 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 before we go any further in this conversation, would you mind repeating that? He said, if I die, I said, well, listen, if Jesus doesn't come back first, you are. So here's my question, are you ready? Because the next step is going to be a judgment seat. So are you ready at that time? Folks, I can't wait to tell you next week of some of the things we're going to be doing in that intermediate state. But this week, I want to ask you, are you going to be there with the Lord? If you're going to be there with the Lord in that glorious place of paradise and heaven, with the thief and all the Old Testament believers and all of those that have died in Christ since he ascended into heaven. If you're going to be there, that means you've got to be in Jesus today. You got to know him. You got to put your trust in him. And you know my invitation to Jesus, talk to me. I'll be glad to introduce you. I'll be glad to pray with you. I'll be glad to talk with you. But I want you to be in Christ. That's what makes the intermediate state and the final state the most glorious. We'll be with him for all eternity. New body, new heavens, new earth. The intermediate state, glorious. We'll look at it next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've been able to be together in your word tonight. Thank you, Father, for the privilege just to begin to build our understanding from the word of God about our comfort, joy, and salvation in life and in death. 
So I pray now that we have, now that we have resumed our study, that I pray first of all that everyone here will understand that while when they die, their body goes to the ground, you're the soul of a believer you do take to be with you. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And it will be gain and better than here. I pray, Father, though, that everyone here has come to you. So they will be there with you. And I pray that their heart and soul will be filled to overflowing with the presence of Jesus by his spirit, with his word now even as we anticipate a being with him then. Jesus, come quickly. Please come. And catch us up to the new heavens and the new earth. But if this is not your appointed time, please, in this day, help us to live with no fear in life or death. For Christ is our life, and to live is Christ. To die is gain. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you. Let's sing the doxology to the pray. Ben, oh, there you are, Ben. Great. I was afraid I was going to have to do it. They were afraid I was going to have to do it. So praise the Lord. You're here. And Caitlin, thank you. Let's uh, lead in the doxology. May the, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And our Savior is our comfort and our joy in life and in death. And God's people said, amen. amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. Wait, can I just say one more thing for you before you leave? I think I'm a little early, in fact. Yeah, I'm three minutes early, so can I just say one thing uh, to you before you leave? Did you know when we do that in heaven, you're going to raise your hands? That's what the Bible said. Intermediate state and the final state. You're going to raise your hands. So some of you might want to get into practice. And guess what? They'll be above your shoulders. Well, I don't know that. Y'all have a great week. The Lord bless you.